Has anybody here ever been to the Museum of Science and Industry down in Chicago? And you've seen the big submarine that's there? Or have you been down to Manitowoc to the Maritime Museum and the, uh, the submarine that's there? Or you've just ever seen a big Navy ship in real life? I want you to get that picture and that image in your mind this morning and open with me to our scripture reading for today, James chapter 2 and verse 14. James is the book immediately after Hebrews. It's a very small book, so sometimes a little tougher to find. But James chapter 2 and verse 14. And if you didn't bring a Bible, hopefully there's one in the pew in front of you. James 2.14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Now I want you to put a piece of paper at this point in your Bible or bookmark or however you want to keep reference to it because we're going to come back to it in a little bit. But I want you to turn back now to the beginning of the Bible to Genesis, Genesis chapter 12. Now the last time that I gave this sermon, I was told that I went through it too quickly by someone. So I'm going to attempt to try to slow it down a little bit this time. But that might mean that it may take a little bit longer. So I don't want anybody to complain about the time. Fair enough? All right. Nobody said it wasn't. So this morning, I want to talk a little bit about righteousness by faith. If you saw in your bulletin uh, next weekend at the Sheboygan Church, we were having the annual Sheboygan, uh, the annual Righteousness by Faith Symposium. Uh, everybody's invited to come to that. There'll be a number of different speakers. We'll have fellowship meal. But this morning, I want to talk a little about righteousness by faith. Abraham is called the father of the faithful. And in James 2.23, he is called the friend of God. So when we talk about righteousness by faith, it's helpful if we take a look at the life of Abraham. And at the end of Genesis chapter 11, we find that Abraham and his family have left Ur of the Chaldeans And they've traveled to Haran. And here in Haran, Abraham's father dies. So our starting point is way, way over there on the left where it says Ur. And then they travel up to Haran. That is a distance of about 600 miles. That's like walking from Green Bay to Kansas City, Missouri. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. So we see here that the Lord gives Abraham a commandment. He gives him an instruction. He tells him to do something. And what did he tell Abraham to do? He told him to leave his country and his family. So at this point, Abraham had a choice. He could choose to do as God had instructed, or he could choose not to. The question was, did Abraham trust the Lord enough to obey him? Was he willing to leave his family and travel far away to an undisclosed location? Did he trust God enough to give up everything that he knew for a life of uncertainty? The only thing that Abraham knew for sure was that God was going to be leading him. Do you think that Abraham could explain his actions and be understood by his friends as he chose to leave? Remember, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Now, the Bible doesn't say that Abraham questioned God about the details regarding the land of promise, like whether the soil was fertile and the climate healthy, whether the country had agreeable surroundings, or if it would give him great opportunities to get rich. God had spoken, and Abraham obeyed. Today, many are still tested like Abraham was. You may be asked to abandon a career that promises wealth and honor or to leave pleasant and profitable associations and possibly separate from your family. You may be asked to leave behind things that are familiar and cherished, things that you may really like or even love. You may be called upon to enter a path that only appears to be one of self-denial, hardship, and sacrifice. How will you respond? So God called Abraham to leave his country and family. And what did God promise to do if Abraham trusted and obeyed him? 
verse 2. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And how did Abraham respond? Verse 4, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So they came to the land of Canaan, and verse 6 says, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, and the Canaanites were then in the land. So now he's gone from Haran to Shechem. That's a distance of about 400 miles, which is like walking from Green Bay to Indianapolis. It says the Canaanites were then in the land. So Abraham had reached his goal only to find a country that was already occupied by another people, and it was overspread with idolatry. Imagine looking around the promised land and discovering that there are many altars set up to false gods and there are human sacrifices dotting the hillside. This is the land of Canaan, the land of promise. How about today? As you look around our land, do you see any altars set up to false gods? Like the God of fashion, the God of money, the God of entertainment, TV, music, sports, the God of just simply keeping up with the Joneses. Are people today sacrificing themselves to these gods? And what about us? Are we worshiping any of them? The first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. Verse 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord, and he moved from there to Bethel. So now he's gone from Shechem to Bethel, which is only about 20 miles. Verse 10, now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there. So now he's gone from Bethel to Egypt, and that's about 225 miles, which is like walking from Green Bay down through Chicago to the Indiana border. Verse 11, And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So we see that Abraham had a hottie for a wife. Now, It's not a bad thing to have a hottie for a wife. I've got one myself. But where is Abraham's trust in the Lord at this point? Instead of trusting the Lord, he encourages his hot wife to be deceptive with him and speak a lie. Verse 14. So it was when Abram came into Egypt and the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake and he gave him a bunch of animals and servants. So Abraham profited off of the lie. Verse 17, But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. Did the Lord want Abraham to witness to Pharaoh and the Egyptians? Was Abraham a faithful witness? No. Does the Lord expect us to be a faithful witness for him wherever we are? Abraham was given a test in going to Egypt. How did he do? He failed the test. Is the Lord giving us daily opportunities to witness for him? And how are we doing with those tests? So now he returns back from Egypt, the 225 miles back to Bethel, and verse 13, or I'm sorry, chapter 13, verse 1. Then Abram went up from Egypt and lot with him to the south. Now it says to the south here. It's not referring to the direction they are heading because obviously they are heading north. When it says south, it is referring to that area of the country was referred to as the south region of Canaan. So it just refers to it as the south. 
Verse 2, Abram was very rich in livestock and in silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So we notice that Abram returned to the altar which he had made before, and there he called on the name of the Lord. This is after he had let go of his trust in the Lord by deceiving Pharaoh. And what is the lesson for us? If we have let go of our trust in the Lord, we may need to return spiritually to the beginning of our walk and reconnect with the Lord just as we did at the start of our Christian experience. Verse 6. Now the land was not able to support Abraham and Lot, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together, and there was strife between their herdsmen. So Abram said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please, separate from me. If you take to the left, then I will go to the right, and if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Now Abraham was Lot's senior in years, his superior in relation, in wealth, and in position. But it was Abraham who first proposed plans to preserve the peace. Although the whole land had been given solely to Abraham by God himself, Abraham graciously waived this right, and he offered to share it with Lot. So here we see the noble and unselfish spirit of Abraham. If put in a similar position, position how would you respond how many households have been torn apart by selfishness how many churches have been divided because of a me first attitude and end up making the name of Christianity a byword and a reproach among the world Romans 12 verse 10 says be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Verse 10, And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. And verse 11, Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Does it really matter where we pitch our tent? Can't we just pitch our tent wherever we want? Are there consequences to our choice of where we pitch our tent? And where have you pitched your tent? Is it where the Lord wants it to be? Or is it just where you wanted it to be? Verse 14, And the Lord said to Abram, Lift your eyes now and look. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. Verse 18, Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt in Hebron and built an altar there to the Lord. So now he's gone from from, uh, Bethel to Hebron, which is, there we go, went uh, south to Hebron, uh, which is about 35 miles. In the first few verses of chapter 14, we find that there is a battle between a group of four kings and a group of five kings, and the four kings prevail, and Sodom and Gomorrah are on the losing end. And as a result, Lot is taken captive. We're going to pick up in verse 13. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. So now he's gone from Hebron up to Hobah. That's about 160 miles. That's like going from Green Bay down to Beloit to fight the armies of four kings. And verse 17, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the rescue. So think about this. The king of Sodom went out to meet Abraham, the friend of God. That's like saying the mayor of Las Vegas went out to meet Abraham, the friend of God. Now, Abraham knew who the king of Sodom was. He knew what he represented and what went on in his city. And here was this king coming out to meet Abraham. But it wasn't just the king of Sodom who came out to meet him. 
Verse 18, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, Salem, that is Jerusalem, the king of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So Abraham has recovered all that was taken in the battle. And Melchizedek recognizes that it was God who delivered Abraham's enemies into his hand. If something is delivered to you, that indicates that it was brought to you. You didn't go and get it yourself. Someone else did all of the work and you received the thing that they brought to you. It says God delivered the enemies into Abraham's hand. Clearly, Abraham and his 318 men were outnumbered against the armies of four kings. Did Abraham take all of the credit for this accomplishment? Did he say, to the victor go the spoils, so everything is mine? What did Abraham do instead? It says, he gave him a tithe of all. So Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of everything. This is the first reference to tithe in the Bible. And what does the word tithe mean? Literally, it means a tenth part, or as we would say, 10%. So Abraham gave 10% of the spoils to Melchizedek, the priest of God Most High. Verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. So the king of Sodom offered all the goods that were plundered by the four kings to Abraham. Essentially, all the wealth and possessions of the cities were offered to one individual. Imagine, you have risked your life and rescued all the sinful people of Las Vegas. And then the mayor offers you all the wealth of Las Vegas for what you did. We're talking about billions of dollars. Would you take it? Verse 22, But Abram said to the king of Las Vegas, I mean Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will take that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich, except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me. Let them take their portion. So Abraham left his wife behind. He traveled 160 miles over rough terrain. He risked losing his life and the lives of all of his men to face the armies of four kings who had just defeated five other kings. And then he gave 10% of the spoils to the Lord and the other 90% he gave to the king of Sodom and the men who went with him. And Abraham walked away with nothing, materialistically speaking, after doing all of this. But today... There are people who work a relatively cushy job. They don't have to risk their life fighting the armies of four different kings, yet they grumble about or just outright refuse to return the Lord's tithe back to him. If you are ever tempted to not return the Lord's tithe back to him, remember this part of Abraham's life. Remember the risk that he took and what he did with the spoils and how he paid a faithful tithe to the Lord. Chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. So, after what things did the word of the Lord come to Abraham? Well, after he had rescued Lot, crushed the armies of four kings, and paid a tithe to the Lord. So you notice the word of the Lord came to Abraham after he had paid his tithe. And what did the Lord say? He said, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, Abraham didn't keep any of the spoils. So we can understand the Lord saying, I am your exceedingly great reward. In essence, he's saying, look, I got you covered. But why would the Lord 
tell Abraham not to be afraid right after Abraham had just defeated the armies of four kings. Do you think those defeated nations would be looking to get revenge on Abraham for what he did? Absolutely. And do you think Abraham might be thinking about this? Remember, this is the same Abraham who was afraid that Pharaoh would kill him just to get his hot wife. And he hadn't even attacked Pharaoh's armies. Do you think that Abraham suspected that he would live the rest of his life constantly looking over his shoulder? Thus the Lord tells him, Do not be afraid. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Verse 2. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Does it sound like Abraham is real happy with the Lord right here? Do you think maybe he's starting to question whether the Lord was going to fulfill his promise to make him a great nation since he didn't have any children yet? Do we ever question the Lord when things don't quite work out the way we think they should? Verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you were able to number them. So shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed in the Lord, and the Lord accounted it to him for righteousness. So that's the end right there, right? Abraham believed in the Lord, and the Lord accounted it to him for righteousness. Well, that's righteousness by faith, correct? But is this the end of the story of Abraham? Does the Bible say that from here on out it was just smooth sailing for him? Was there nothing more that Abraham had to do because the Lord accounted righteousness to him for his belief? Let's keep reading. Verse 7, Then the Lord said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Wait, what? Now Abraham is back to questioning the Lord? He wants proof from the Lord? How shall I know that I will inherit it? So the Lord gives Abraham some homework. He tells him to bring him a sacrifice. Now what if Abraham had said, no, I'm not going to bring you these sacrifices? Would the Lord still have accounted Abraham's prior belief in him as righteousness? Or did Abraham still have something to do in this process? So Abraham brings the sacrifices to the Lord and then in verse 18, it says, On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land. This is the first time that the word covenant is used in the story of Abraham. And what is a covenant? It's an agreement. A contract is a word that we use more commonly. So the Lord, on the same day, made a contract with Abraham. Now, in most instances, if we have a contract with someone, it means that each party has something to do in order for the contract to be complete. If only one party does something and the second party doesn't do what they agreed to do, we call that a breach of contract. So the only way that the contract is fulfilled is if all the parties involved do what they agreed to do. And throughout the Bible, God gives us these if-then contracts. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, it says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God gives us these if-then contracts that can't be fulfilled unless every part of it is completed. And here God reestablishes and clearly identifies the contract that he entered into with Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12 at the beginning of his journey. This is the Lord's covenant or contract with Abraham. He says, you left your country, your family, and your father's house, and you had no idea where you were going. Because you trusted me and you did that, 
I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. I will give this land to your descendants. Then in chapter 16, we find that Abraham is 85 years old now. He's been waiting 10 years for the Lord to give him children. And it hasn't happened yet. So he and his wife decide to take matters into their own hands and get somebody else to have children for Abraham. Now as they take matters into their own hands, are they still trusting the Lord? Are they still following God's plan? Husbands, even when your wife's idea seems like a good suggestion, still take it before the Lord. If we take matters into our own hands and we stop trusting the Lord, often there are long-term consequences. And what was the result of Abraham, Sarai, and Hagar taking matters into their own hands? His name is Ishmael. And what religion traces its roots to Ishmael? Islam. Was that God's original plan to have two different religions come out of Abraham? No. This was the result of Abraham taking matters into his own hands. And does the choice that he made 4,000 years ago still impact us today? Absolutely. So we see that choices that we make today can have long-term effects. Chapter 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my contract between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. So here, God makes an implied if-then contract. If you will walk before me and are blameless, then I will make my contract between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Had Abraham been walking blamelessly before God up to this point? No. He had taken matters into his own hands 14 years prior, and he had a child with a woman who was not his wife. Verse 3, Then Abram fell on his face. And God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my contract is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will establish my contract between me and you and your descendants after you for an everlasting contract. Also I give to you and your descendants the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So God's saying, look, here's my side of the contract. Here's what I'm going to do. Verse 9. Now he tells Abraham, here's what you're going to do. As for you, you shall keep my contract, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my contract, which you shall keep. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. Verse 14. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. And why was he to be cut off from his people? Because, the Lord says right here, he has broken my contract. So God lays out what he will do and what Abraham has to do in order for this contract to be fulfilled. When the Lord informed Abraham that part of this contract involved him taking a knife and cutting off the flesh of his foreskin, I wonder if Abraham thought, wait a minute. I thought two chapters ago in Genesis 15, you said that since I believed in you, that you counted it to me for righteousness. Thus, righteousness by faith. But now, I have to cut off the flesh of my foreskin as a part of this contract? So does it sound like Abraham still had a part to play in this process? And what if Abraham had said, no, I won't cut off the flesh of my foreskin? Where does that leave his experience regarding righteousness by faith? And let's look at those words, righteousness by faith. What does the word righteousness mean? It means doing what's right. It's all it literally means, right doing. And what about the word faith? We use the word faith, but the word more commonly that we use is trust which means the same thing. So the literal translation of righteousness by faith means doing what's right 
By trust. Well, by trusting who? Yourself? No. By trusting God. So righteousness by faith means you trust God and because of that trust, you do whatever he asks you to do. It doesn't matter if you are comfortable with it or not or whether it makes complete sense to you or not. Now there is the imputed righteousness aspect of the statement righteousness by faith. But there is also the aspect of doing what's right simply because you trust God and he asks you to do it. And if you completely trust him, then you will let God work in you to change those things that you don't really want to change. This is what Abraham had to do and this is what each one of us must do. God asked Abraham to leave his country and his family and Abraham obeyed. God asked him to cut off the flesh of his foreskin and again, Abraham obeyed. Did you know that today, if an adult male is to be circumcised, they use anesthetic? They didn't have anesthetic in Abraham's setting. Tell me, how many men would join the church today if part of the requirement to join the church was to cut off flesh from a sensitive area of your body without any anesthetic? When you have to do that, when you have to sacrifice and physically give up a sensitive part of your body, you aren't joining that group unless you really want to be a part of it and are completely committed to it. So how is our relationship with the Lord? Would we be willing to cut off a sensitive part of our body without anesthetic if the Lord asked us to? And what if he asked you to keep the Sabbath? What if he asked you to pay tithe? What if he asked you to refrain from wearing certain items that everyone else wears? What if he asked you to not eat certain foods or drink certain beverages? The question is, what am I willing to give up and sacrifice for the Lord? So as a part of the contract, Abraham has to be circumcised and sacrifice the flesh of his foreskin. And then the Lord tells Abraham that Sarah is going to give birth to a son. And how did Abraham respond? Verse 17. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. So Abraham fell on his face and he laughed at God. Not because God told him to be circumcised, but because the Lord told him that he was going to have a child when he was 100 years old and his wife was 90. Verse 19, Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. Verse 21, My contract I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Verse 23, So Abraham took Ishmael and every male of his house and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very same day as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old and Ishmael was 13. Was Abraham a procrastinator? Absolutely not. Everyone who was going to be a part of his house was circumcised that very same day. What does that say about Abraham as a leader? I wonder if any of the people in his house said, hey, aren't we being a little hasty here? You want to cut what off of my body? And it has to be done today? Are you procrastinating with something the Lord is asking you to do? If so, what excuse would you try to give to Abraham to explain why you are procrastinating in view of what God asked him to do and his response to the Lord? It was circumcisions all around that day. And what if someone had refused to be circumcised? What did the Lord say should happen to them? He said they were to be cut off from the household of Abraham. And why? Because they had broken the contract. So again, we see that they had a part to fulfill in the contract, or a part to do in fulfilling the contract, that contract that was established through righteousness by faith. Either they trusted the Lord enough to do what he told them to do, or they didn't. 
In chapter 18, in the first part, we find that the Lord visits Abraham again. And the Lord again tells Abraham that Sarah is going to have a son in the next year. And Sarah thinks that this is impossible because she and Abraham are too old. And to this, the Lord responds by saying, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Never forget that statement. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Nothing. Even helping you overcome your sinful ways is not too hard for the Lord. In the second part of the chapter, we find Abraham bargaining with the Lord for the wicked cities. Now, Abraham knew just how wicked Sodom and Gomorrah were, but even though he hated the sin of those wicked cities, we see just how much he loved the souls of those sinners. And do you realize he bargained with the Lord and he started at 50 and he ended at 10? That's an 80% reduction in the requirement to preserve an entire city. Most people would consider that some pretty good bargaining skills. If Abraham was negotiating for the salvation of Green Bay today, would the Lord find enough righteous here to save it? And more importantly, would you be one of them? And would I be one of them? May the Lord have mercy on us all. In chapter 19, we find the destruction of Sodom. In chapter 20, And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and stayed in Gerar. So now he's gone from Hebron to Gerar, which is about 40 miles. Verse 2, Now Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Wait, what? I thought Abraham did this once before. I thought he learned his lesson the first time around. I thought he was trusting God implicitly now because he believed in God and God counted it to him as righteousness. I mean, he left his family and his country. He cut off the flesh of his foreskin. But now, Abraham has let go of his trust in the Lord again. If the Lord knows that you struggle in an area, do you think he wants to help you overcome it? And if so, do you think that he will test you, possibly repeatedly in that area, to see if you will choose to trust him instead of yourself? Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. The men in the congregation should be somewhat familiar with that because that verse is hanging in the men's bathroom. So Abraham is being tested again over his wife. Verse 3, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and he said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. How would you like that for a dream? But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God said to him, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, Know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So you notice, here the Lord gives Abimelech an if-then contract. If you do not restore her, then know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. That's a pretty sobering if-then contract. Verse 8, so Abimelech rose early in the morning. You notice he didn't sleep in late that day. And he called his servants and he told them all these things and the men were very afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and he said to him, what have you done to us? How have I offended you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. What did you have in view that you have done this thing? I thought Abraham was a man of God. I thought he was the friend of God. I thought he was the father of the faithful those who trust the Lord with all their heart. 
God even told Abimelech that Abraham was a prophet. But now Abraham is getting called out by Abimelech. You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. Verse 11. And Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will kill me on account of my hot, pregnant, 90-year-old wife. I mean, man, she must have been really good looking. Verse 14. Then Abimelech gives Abraham more animals and servants, and he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. Verse 15. And Abimelech said, See, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. Then to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus she was rebuked. Has anyone here ever been rebuked by someone and they gave you a thousand pieces of silver and a bunch of animals and servants? Abraham lived a truly blessed life. Verse 17. So Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. Now was Abraham supposed to be witnessing to Abimelech for the Lord? And what kind of a witness was Abraham to Abimelech? What kind of a witness are you and I to our neighbors, co-workers, family members, church family, and even complete strangers? How are we measuring up? Does the Lord care what kind of a witness we are for Him? Or are we just counted righteous because we believe in the Lord? So it doesn't really matter what we do. Chapter 21, Sarah conceives and gives birth to Isaac. And verse 6, And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Ladies, can you imagine giving birth to and nursing a child when you are 90 years old? Verse 8, so the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw Ishmael scoffing. Therefore she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be an heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. Did Abraham love Ishmael? Absolutely. That was his son. That That was a part of him. Did he love Hagar? Yeah, but he wasn't supposed to because Sarah was his wife. Was Ishmael even supposed to exist? No. And what happens when we love something or someone that the Lord doesn't want us to? Does it ever turn out for the best? Verse 12. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Verse 14, So Abraham rose early in the morning. Did he procrastinate? And he took bread and a skin of water, and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to Hagar, and he sent her away. How hard would it be to kick out from your house your son and his mother to send them out into the wilderness? But did the Lord tell him to do it? Did Ishmael exist because Abraham listened to the counsel of his wife and took matters into his own hands rather than trusting and waiting on the Lord? There were hard, painful consequences to Abraham's choice. A choice he had made more than 14 years before this. And now he was suffering for it. At the end of the chapter, we find that Abraham enters into a contract with Abimelech regarding a water well. And despite Abimelech's prior encounter with Abraham, you know, 
the encounter where Abraham lied to him and almost got him killed by the Lord, despite that prior encounter, Abimelech can see that God is with Abraham in all that he does. In verse 32, thus they made a contract at Beersheba. In verse 34, and Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines many days. So how long is many days? We don't know. Many days. That could be weeks, months, years. Chapter 22, verse 1. Now it came to pass after these... Well, after what things? After everything that's happened in Abraham's life up to this point. After all of that. So after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. So God tested Abraham. Why? Why would God test Abraham? I thought back in Genesis 15, it said that Abraham believed in the Lord and the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. If that was the end of the matter and Abraham's eternal destiny was sealed, why is God testing him now? And ultimately, God is testing him to prove him, to find out if his profession is real, to find out how he will truly act when he is put under a strain. So you say that you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Well, that's wonderful. But how do you handle the tests that God allows you to go through? Has anyone here ever been tested by the Lord? And does he just test you once in your lifetime and that's it? Verse 2, Then God said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So the Lord had Abraham send Ishmael away, and now he tells him to kill Isaac. Throughout his life, did it seem like Abraham had longed to have a son? Is it possible that he wanted a son so badly that he would be tempted to treat his son as more important than God and thus violate the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering. How would you feel if God said this to you about one of your children? Take your only fill in the blank and offer them to me. Verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning. Did he procrastinate? And he saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. So they traveled three days to get to the mountain. What do you think was going through Abraham's mind for those three days? Do you think he was just skipping along the road, humming a cheery tune and seeing how far he could throw rocks? Or do you think that he was in constant, agonizing, soul-searching prayer? Do you think he slept much those three nights, knowing that in a couple of days, his son would be dead by his own hand? Three days is a long time. Abraham had plenty of time to doubt God during those three days if he wanted to. And do you think the devil was right there tempting him to disregard the command of the Lord? Do you think he kept whispering to him, Abraham, you believed in the Lord and it was already counted to you for righteousness. You don't need to do this. Do you think the devil told him, look at you like a second Cain. You've already kicked out Ishmael. If you kill Isaac, how will the promises of God be fulfilled? You will be left childless. And what will Sarah think when you come back and you tell her what you've done? She will have a nervous breakdown. The shock will probably kill her. And if Sarah dies, then you will be left without a wife 
especially since you already kicked out Hagar. If you do what the Lord has told you to do, you are going to end up miserable. You'll be all alone in your old age. Is that really what you want? That was probably the longest three days of Abraham's life. Verse 5. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went on together. Now the word used here to refer to Isaac as lad is the exact same word that is translated young men to refer to the men who came with them. So Isaac wasn't a small child at this point. Ishmael was also called a lad by the exact same word, original language, when he left Abraham, and he was well over 14 years old at that point. Plus, Abraham had left the two young men behind while he and Isaac went on alone, so the young men were probably more mature than a couple of 14-year-olds. And since the same word is used for those young men and Isaac, he most likely wasn't an immature teenager at this point, but was more likely a young man probably in his late teens or early 20s. It says, Abraham laid the wood on Isaac. So Isaac is carrying enough wood for a sacrifice, which was previously being carried by a donkey, so it wasn't just a little bit of wood. And Isaac is carrying all of this wood, and he's carrying it up a mountain. This would indicate that he had the strength, the stamina, and the vigor of a young man, and most likely was in much better physical shape than Abraham at this point in their lives. Verse 7. But Isaac spoke to Abraham and said, My father, do you think those words broke Abraham's heart? Abraham knows that very soon he is going to kill and sacrifice his son to the Lord. And after he does that, he will never again hear his son's voice call to him, Father, Remember, Abraham has been walking for the last three days. He probably hasn't slept a wink, and he probably hasn't eaten much. How well do you handle life-altering stress when you're hungry, sleep-deprived, and exhausted? The only way to make it through those times and to maintain a Christian walk is to cast all your cares upon the Lord. And Abraham said, Here I am, my son. Then Isaac said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Can I hear an amen? So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told Abraham. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order and he bound Isaac his son and he laid him on the altar upon the wood. So remember, Abraham is most likely stressed to the hilt at this point. His heart rate is probably through the roof. He's wore out from walking and not sleeping and probably not eating for the last three days. Picture Abraham with trembling voice revealing to his son the divine message that he is to be sacrificed. And imagine what went through Isaac's mind when he learned his fate. Now Isaac is in much better physical shape so he can easily run away from his aged father if he wants to and not have to be a sacrifice. But for some reason, Isaac did not resist. Instead, he agrees to be bound and laid upon the altar. Why? Why did Isaac do this? Maybe it was because of the relationship that he saw between his father and God. Maybe it was because of how his father had treated him his whole life. Maybe it was because of all those morning and evening family worships that they had had together, which helped Isaac establish his own personal relationship with God. 
But given the circumstances, Isaac must have agreed to be sacrificed. He must have agreed to give up his life and say, not my will, but God's will be done. Otherwise, he would have escaped. Jesus also agreed to be sacrificed for us. Otherwise, he too could have easily escaped. Imagine Abraham and Isaac there. Do you see Abraham's hands shaking as he binds the cords that hold his son to the altar? Do you see the two of them, father and son, together for the last time? The last words of love are spoken. The last tears are shed. The last kiss and embrace are given. Do you think Abraham wanted to release his grasp and let go of that final hug, knowing what was coming next? But he did let go, and he surrendered his son to the Lord. He stopped holding on to Isaac. Verse 10, And Abraham stretched out his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So you notice, God says, now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son from me. This is righteousness by faith. It's doing whatever God asks you to do because you completely trust Him, even when you don't understand. Thus, Abraham demonstrated righteousness by faith. What is the Lord asking you to lay on the altar and not withhold from Him? Is it a child? Is it a job? Is it a habit, a thought process, a relationship, a friendship? What will it take for the Lord to be able to say to you, now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your blank, your only blank from me? Verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sea which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. What if Abraham had not been willing to give up Isaac? would we still call him the father of the faithful? Would he have exhibited righteousness by faith? Hebrews 11.19 says, Abraham concluded that God was able to raise up Isaac even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So turn back to James chapter 2 now, our scripture reading where you put that bookmark. James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Well, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well, but even the demons believe and tremble. Do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works 
and by works faith was made perfect. And thus the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. In Testimonies for the Church, volume 4, page 228, it reads, Our good works alone will not save any of us, but we cannot be saved without good works. And after we have done all that we can do, in the name and the strength of Jesus, we are to say, we are unprofitable servants. We are not to think that we have made great sacrifices and that we should receive some great reward for our feeble services. I was contemplating faith and works and I was praying and I said, Lord, help me to understand the relationship between faith and works and how this all works. And this is what the Lord brought to me. Imagine your boat has capsized in the middle of the cold Atlantic Ocean. You are treading water, but your body keeps getting colder and colder. Your muscles are cramping up and you can barely keep your head above the water. A massive hurricane is headed right towards you. And not far away, there's a giant whirlpool that is sucking everything down into it. In this scenario, is there anything that you can do to save yourself? No. You are completely helpless. The only way that you're getting out of this mess is if someone saves you. Now there's a pleasure cruise ship that is sinking next to you and it's titled, No Rules, Unlimited Freedom. All the people on the sinking ship, including its entire crew and captain, keep encouraging you to join them. They tell you what a wonderful time they are having and that you will have the time of your life once you are on board. This ship only has one rule. Do whatever you want. It doesn't matter what you do. You won't be punished. Anything goes. It's just one massive, continuous, non-stop, violent party. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? How many of you would get on that ship? As you're watching this sinking ship, you continue to struggle in the water to stay alive. And then, all of a sudden, you see a massive battleship. But it's not in the water. Instead, it's flying through the sky. This massive battleship comes down and it lands in the water on the other side of you. This ship is called the ultimate flying battleship. Now this battleship is at least a trillion times bigger than any ship that's ever been made. In fact, it looks like it reaches all the way up to heaven. This ship can withstand any storm or an attack by any enemy. Everything that you need to live and everything that will truly make you happy is available on board. If it's not available on the ship, it's because you don't really need it or it won't really bring you true happiness. Hanging on the side of the ship, reaching all the way down into the water, is a rope ladder. It's called a Jacob's Ladder. The ship builder who built the ship all by himself with his own bare hands is also the captain of the ship. And he offers free passage on the ship to anyone who wants to come aboard. You watch as the shipbuilder himself comes down from the bridge or the command center of the ship and he walks on the water out to where you were struggling for your life. After walking on the water to get over to where you are, he then sinks down into the water right next to you. He stretches out his hand to offer you help. And as he does, you notice on the palm of his hand the ugliest scar that you have ever seen. You ask him about the scar, and he says, Oh, that. Yeah, I've got one of those in each of my hands. They happened when I was building this ship. But let me tell you, they were completely worth it. You see, this ship wouldn't exist 
without those scars. As his hand is outstretched, he tells you that you don't have to die here in the ocean. You can be saved. But the only way that you can be saved is if you will let him help you climb up the ladder onto the ship. Your only true safety is being on board this ship. He tells you that the ship does have a few rules, but they are for everyone's safety and happiness. You are welcome aboard the ship, and as long as you abide by the rules, you can stay on the ship. Now you notice, you didn't have to keep the rules before you boarded the ship. You are welcome to board the ship just as you are. As simple as the rules are, he, the shipbuilder, understands that you may have a hard time obeying the rules. If you find yourself having a hard time obeying, the shipbuilder will help you obey if you will let him. And if you find that you have broken one of the rules, just ask the shipbuilder for forgiveness and seek to change your ways, and he is more than happy to forgive you and to help you change. Now, as you are struggling in the ocean, in the middle of this storm, does this seem like a good deal? Is it reasonable for the shipbuilder to have rules for everyone on board? Is it reasonable that he should want you to obey the rules for the health and happiness of everyone, including yourself? Would it make sense for the shipbuilder to allow someone to stay on the ship who insisted on continuously breaking the rules? Would it seem logical to keep someone on board who is going around the ship, stealing from everybody and killing other passengers? And all the while, they refused to change their ways and insisted on continuing to do whatever they wanted to do. Does it make sense then that there should be rules on the ship? In this scenario, what would happen if you stayed in the water and you didn't get on the ship? You would be lost. Can you be saved if you aren't on the ship? No. But can you stay on the ship if you choose to continually disregard the rules? No. And what would happen if you stayed in the water, but you kept all of the rules of the ship? Would you still be saved? No. So can keeping the rules save you? No. What is the only thing that can save you? It's the ship. But you can't stay on the ship unless you keep the rules. So keeping the rules is not what will save you. It's the ship that saves you. But you can't stay on that ship and be saved without keeping the rules. This is the balance of faith and works. Works by themselves will not save you. They never could. You can only be saved by the gift of eternal life through the death of Jesus Christ, the shipbuilder. If you accept that gift and you trust the Lord with everything in your life, if you trust him enough to obey his rules, then your works will be the works of God. Your works will be an outflowing of your faith or trust in God. If you were on that massive battleship and it was saving you from drowning in the ocean, would there be any logical reason why you wouldn't follow all the rules of the ship that was saving your life? Following the rules is works, and those works will not save you but you perform those works because of your appreciation for the saving grace of the ship. James 2.21 says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that trust was working together with his works and by works trust was made perfect?